in Riverside just to, um, if it helps, um, it will be d very different from what you'll hear from Larry and Jason later. Um, it's more uh, perhaps similar to what Denver's experienced. It's more uh, indoor as opposed to outdoor and it is regulated as opposed to unregulated. We certainly have our share of um, illegal uh, hash oil labs, uh, butane fires, those things, but this presentation is focused on how you can implement the unified program uh, elements uh, at businesses that require it. And uh, we'll get into some of the, the legal uh, stuff that these, some cities in our jurisdiction have, have done to allow uh, these cultivation operations. So without further ado, and just by a show of hands, how many people are new that weren't in the morning session? Great, cool. So there's some repeat uh, information that we'll briefly go over for those of you that were here, but um, it, it will be very brief. So Riverside County prohibited marijuana cultivation indoors and outdoors in unincorporated parts of the county um, back in 2015. And they, used, they did that under the authority cited there. So um, maybe your jurisdiction did something similar or is looking at doing something similar. That's why I shared those, that, that information. So in unincorporated areas, no cultivations allowed. Uh, dispensaries are still allowed um, with certain <coughs> factors as long as they meet certain uh, elements. Uh, but several cities within the county have uh, gone ahead with their unique city ordinances that have allowed cultivation. So then we're left with this thing of across the street, it's not allowed there, but it is on the other side of the street. Um, so, uh, and the cities that are included are Cathedral City, Desert Hot Springs, um, and Palm Springs, all within the Coachella Valley of uh, Riverside County. Um, with these next few slides, you'll see some of the financial incentives as to why the city's passed ordinances um, allowing cultivation. Um, they passed it in 2013, and you'll, you'll see some of these dates and you'll be like, Wait a second, Prop 64 just passed. These things were in the works and we were regulating them prior to the passage of Prop 64. So just to be clear on that. Um, but they passed uh, a citizen initiative um, that became ordinance that taxed 10 cents on the dollar for every dollar of proceeds. Um, which is, we'll, we'll get into a little bit that it, it adds up very quickly. Uh, Cathedral City a year later, did the same thing, 15 cents on the dollar. Um, but just recently, November of last year, they actually put a, uh, a hold. There's an urgency ordinance that they passed halting uh, further cultivation facilities because what they saw was a huge price bubble that occurred in their city. Uh, they had facilities, long-standing facilities, uh, businesses that we had permitted for like auto shops, paint shops, other things that were being forced out of business because of the zoning that they were in. Those, that was a zoned uh, area that was allowed for cultivation. So landowners or um, <coughs> uh, landlords were saying, get out of here. We can make way more money off of these cultivation facilities. So we literally saw a multi-million dollar price difference between uh, parcels across the street uh, just because of zoning, local zoning. Um, so they saw, the city saw this happening, so they put a hold. Uh, they had dozens of applications before that hold, so they're still processing those. Um, but uh, they were going to revisit this in July because uh, they were very uh, big on making sure that this industry was sustainable and did not uh, damage their local economy if it was, were to uh, kind of uh, just fizzle out after Prop 64 regulations came into effect in 2018. So. They'll be taking a look at that. Uh, Desert Hot Springs uh, legalized the same year as Cathedral City. They tax growers $25 per square foot 
for the first 3,000 square feet, then $10 per square foot after. And you can see there a, a typical nine foot square facility, 9,000 square foot facility that you'll see pictures of later. Um, that's $135,000 per year for just the square footage of that facility, tax revenue for the city. Um, they also are 10 cents on the dollar, 10% of gross sales uh, for each uh, marijuana facility. And again, these are medical marijuana grows. This is all pre Prop 64. So how these cities will cope with uh, recreational uh, marijuana uh, cultivation is that's going to be up to them. But right now, these are, this is all medical marijuana. But they have over 2 million square feet that are planned. Um, and it, if you're been ever been to Coachella Festival or been out to Coachella Valley, you know that you know the temperature is going to reach 125 degrees um, in the summer very easily. So uh, this, that two million square feet is all going to be indoors um, in either existing infrastructure or buildings that will be going up soon, and that has implications for uh, the, our our agency, the Coupa um, Environmental Health, because of all the facilities that we'll need permitting. So why might a marijuana cultivation facility need a unified program permit? Uh, from the presentations you've seen earlier, you already have a taste of why that might be. But we're going to get into some specific specifics here. Our Palm Springs facility <coughs> has 600 pounds, or the equivalent of uh, approximately 5,000 square feet, uh, I'm sorry, cubic feet of carbon dioxide. Um, I know that uh, specifically San Diego County and San Bernardino County have passed local ordinances that uh, increase their threshold up to 6,000 square feet. So if you've done something like that in your jurisdiction, obviously that might not meet threshold quantities for the HMBP program, but uh, we have not. So that is captured because of the uh, health and safety code, a thousand cubic foot threshold. So um, right there, they, they need a hazmat business plan, submittal and SERS, and uh, that permit. Uh, they also uh, can have nitrogen. And you might ask, well, why nitrogen? And it's because of the, um, not just the edibles, uh, but also jo packaged joints or um, other, just in their, uh, where they're keeping their, their buds, they will inert that environment before they wrap it to extend shelf life. So you will see compressed gas nitrogen potentially in any facility that uh, is growing or packaging. Our Desert Hot Springs facility is much larger. Like we, I mentioned our, our previously, 9,000 square feet. They have approximately 24,000 cubic feet of carbon dioxide. That's the equivalent of uh, two 1,000 pound uh, bulk liquid CO2 cylinders, which you'll see pictures of again uh, later. Um, and they also, it also needs, uh, has the plant nutrients as something that was interesting as we in, uh, did our site visits. Um, everything, and as mentioned earlier, everything's organic or everything is a plant nutrient, not a fertilizer. No, 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 that's a plant, plant nutrient. Um, yeah, everything's organic here that we use, uh, and you, we'll see some of the, uh, the hazards of uh, some of the things that are, we saw being used. Uh, but 440 gallons uh, of fertilizers at this particular facility, um, and also a permit for hazardous waste generation because of solvents used, uh, specifically alcohol in this case for the cleaning of uh, their trimming shears uh, because they get oily, and then uh, universal waste lamps, including metal <coughs> halide, high pressure sodium, and fluorescent. Uh, and the specific types and fixtures, Alan will get to touch upon in a little bit. Um, and the question I asked Nicole earlier um, was about the extraction, um, that closed loop process where it goes back and forth, back and forth, and then there's that spent butane contained, presumably, in that cylinder. That's a hazardous waste concern for me, um, unless there's some sort of a reclamation process where that cylinder can go to. That's going to be cost prohibitive for a lot of extraction facilities because compressed gases, as many of you know, are extremely expensive to get rid of as hazardous waste. So unless there's some sort of reclamation process and a, an industry that can support that, um, there's a, a concern there for how they're handling those things. So we're trying to steer some of our facilities that are planning to do extraction, which they are, uh, um, to CO2, but that system is, I want to say, 25 times the cost of a, of a hydrocarbon butane system. At least that's what we've been told. 
So California versus federal law, I thought I'd just touch upon it. It's been mentioned in different ways uh, multiple times. Um, and just a reminder, this was happening prior to Prop 64's passage. So how is it legal? Um, we had our Prop 215 in 1996, our um, medical marijuana program and statute in 2004, uh, SB 420, and then federal law prohibits the growing of, or use of marijuana. Uh, Prop 64 legalizes it, and then it also has our state license system for the cultivation as of uh, January 2018, which Dr. Starr mentioned that they're working on. So it's like, well, how, how, does, how is this working? Um, the DOJ issued some guidance uh, to the Office of the Deputy Attorney General in 2009, and they just basically said, hey, federal resources are such that this isn't an enforcement priority. Um, and then they came out with further guidance in 2013, uh, clarifying that um, pursuing enforcement at legitimate marijuana growth facilities that are regulated by either a state or local entity is just not worth their time, more or less. I mean, it said it much fancier than that, but um, that's the guidance that's come out. So that's what these cities have gleaned on to uh, and have um, thereby authorized the, the cultivation uh, facilities to operate. Um, I think as Hezekiah mentioned earlier, that could change any day. Mm -hmm. So there is a level of risk that these facilities are undertaking. And uh, we're talking millions of dollars, as you'll see by some of the photos uh, that uh, people have invested. Um, there's an example of a permit, and uh, with that I'm gonna turn over the uh, presentation to Alan to show you some, uh, some pictures of what you might be encountering at some of these facilities. Hi, my name's Alan with Riverside County Environmental Health. I'm just basically gonna go over some pictures regarding uh, kind of what Nick was saying about the uh, Desert Hot Springs facility. Um, this is the largest facility we have right now, legal facility we have right now, but it's still much smaller than the facilities that we've encountered in Denver. Um, one of the biggest waste streams that you guys are gonna see, especially for a facility of this size, are gonna be their fluorescent light bulbs or their metal halides, their high pressure sodium. So um, the way this facility is particularly set up is that there are two main rooms that are just used for cloning and vegetation and then they have six large flowering rooms. So for the cloning rooms, what you're gonna see is, uh, this in the picture you'll see right here, all the T5 fluorescent lights. Those ones are gonna be used for the young stage of the plant with fluorescent, uh, with fluorescent light. They give off little to no heat. And since smaller plants and clones aren't fully rooted, they're gonna be more, more prone to desiccation which why it would be ideal to have a cooler light system. The, this next slide is just gonna show uh, the room expanded a bit. It's just gonna uh, show some of the fans to circulate the air so that there's no stagnant air. Um, in the next slide, you're gonna see the metal halides. So these metal halide lamps are for kind of like the teenager stages of plants. Um, they're they're used for, um, these ones are screw-in bulbs. So for these ones, um, the lifespan of these bulbs may not be as long as any, something that is pushed in, kind of like the fluorescent light bulbs. Um, as a quality control issue, these facilities are gonna try to switch out all their light bulbs um, around a year cycle. So for a facility, especially particularly this size, they're gonna go through a lot of light bulbs annually. Um, with the, that's just another picture of the metal halide lamp. So some of the smaller cultivation places that I, uh, that I visited, they won't use the metal halide lamps. Um, there's a lot of opinions whether metal halide actually helps for the <coughs> growing process. Because you can Google what's the best way to grow, but there's, there's no one way. Everybody has their own opinions about it. Um, but this facility is implementing just because they have the space for it, they have the sheer size for it. And the, with the metal halides, they'll usually keep them on 24-7. Um, but then again, this is just for this particular facility. <coughs> now the high pressure sodium uh, lights are used during the reproductive. They give a, a, a red-orange spectrum, which helps with reproductive growth. The metal halides are kind of used just to grow the plant, uh, get it bulkier, stockier. And the high pressure sodium is what they'll use to uh, start the flowering phase. 
So with the high pressure sodium, the way it's set up in this, uh, in this particular facility is, I'll show you a picture later of the actual flowering room. You're gonna see a, a bunch of these lights on a, on a track system so that they can equally uh, distribute the light. And for these ones, um, trying to remember, I believe they have a 12 hour on, 12 hour off cycle. So there are gonna be times where the lights are gonna be off in the room. And I've been to particular facilities where uh, I've tried to inspect them, but they said, hey, the lights are off. You can go in there with the lights off, but I was like, nah, I'm not gonna do that. <laughs> yeah, I'll come back later, it's not worth it. Um, like, might be good to invest in those green lights, yeah, flashlights. So, um, and I'm sorry if a lot of this information is repeated, especially if you guys visited the other cannabis classes throughout the Coupa conference. It's, it's gonna be a repeat of everything. Even then, I was still taking notes, like, okay, yeah. yeah. But, um, so this large facility is also implementing CO2, which is one of the good benefits for the indoor facilities. They can kind of, uh, they, have, they can have more harvest cycle. I believe this facility, every two months, they're going through a harvest and they're using us, they're pumping in CO2 into the system uh, to help with growth. So this is one of the CO2 tanks at the facility. So what you'll see is this is what one, a 1,000 pound tank. They have two of these, one for each building. It's separated into two buildings, kind of a parallel to each other. Now, to, just to kind of give it into scale, you can kind of see a CO2 tank behind it. That is something, that is the size, about 400 pounds. And that's what you would typically see at a fast food restaurant. So it is, it is a lot bigger than, uh, than, than when compared to those ones. But um, going to a lot of the facilities, the smaller uh, dispensaries, which are trying to set up for CO2, they're more likely going to use these, those smaller tanks rather than the large ones, because this is a large facility. Now, even though, uh, even though there is a facility might be using CO2 on site, it doesn't necessarily mean that they have a CO2 tank. Um, one of the things that was, meant, what that was mentioned earlier was uh, CO2 generators. There is a smaller uh, facility in Cathedral City that is using the CO2 generators and they're just running off uh, natural gas. Um, I know there are several facilities out there in the desert that do have uh, propane tanks tied into them, which they may be able to implement it if those do become uh, cannabis facilities. So I'll just give a bit of information uh, of CO2 levels, which is something that was already talked about earlier. I'll just brush up a little bit on it. Um, optimum grow, depending on who you talk to with the growth facilities, because I'm always asking these guys questions because it's, it's an interesting industry and everybody has their own answers to it. So optimum growth rate, it seems to be somewhere around 1,200 to 1,500. Um, this particular facility has CO2 monitors, which I'll show in later pictures. Um, they have it set to 3,000 parts per million. Uh, the OSHA permissible exposure limit is 5,000 parts per million over an eight hour time weighted average. And the ideal age is 40,000, which under normal operations, they should be well below any of those levels. Um, facilities don't usually run, C these facilities don't usually run CO2 dur during the dark cycle because it's not being, uh, there's no intake of it which they could have it on, but it's kind of like wasting money. And this is just a chart kind of showing the, uh, the normal CO2 levels. So atmosphere is about 350 parts per million, which is your normal, uh, your normal air. And then uh, one of the things I did want to mention, even though the, re the regulatory limit is set at 5,000, I have been told by certain growers that around 1500, they already start feeling dizzy or, or stiff. Cause when I tell them, well, your limit's 5,000. It's like, oh, I don't know about that. I was like, I was in there 1500 and I was already passing out. But when you go into those rooms, it's, it's humid, it's warm. I guess being in there for a prolonged amount of time, it, it could get to you, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're going over the limits, but there are symptoms associated with it. So this is, this is one of the CO2 monitors that they have on site. They, they're using two different uh, types of monitoring systems in there, and this one's the first one. So what it'll show, it'll show a display reading of the parts per million in the room. And 
you'll notice that it's on a, on a yellow alarm system right there. So what he basically did, he tested it. It's not like that was the, the level when we went in. What he would basically do is, kind of wish I had a laser pointer, but on the bottom you'll see that little hole right there. Basically that's where it takes the reading of CO2. So he just went in, took a breath in there, just to elevate the levels, just to show that it would alarm. And uh, Desert Hot Springs is requiring them to have, uh, to have a type of monitoring system. So this monitoring system is the other one that they have. This one is a bit more high tech because it does take temperature, humidity, light, and CO2 levels. Now you'll notice in here that this particular panel is for the, for the cloning and the vegetation room, which right there they don't run, they don't run as high levels as they would during flowering. I'm moving on. So for the CO, the CO2 monitoring panel, this, this actual manufacturer has kind of like a box that they put in the center of the room and that's where it takes all its readings from. And even when you're looking at the panels, there is a, a small discrepancy in the numbers in there. So the way, the way they kind of figure it is that the, the true value is somewhere in between that range. That's just the, the bottom of the sensor. Okay, so this is just a picture of the flowering room, kind of like as I was showing earlier, you'll see all the tracks right there running the lights. So these rooms are pretty large and when you see, and this, in this room in particular, they just went from the vegetation to flowering so the plants are still pretty small. But in one of the other rooms where they were more fully grown, they were about five or six feet, kind of looks like a small jungle in there. But um, for these ones, the city of Desert Hot Springs is requiring uh, any cultivation facility to have some kind of odor control. And uh, for this particular facility, they're using a large uh, carbon filters through, that they run through the HVAC system. Now, this is what they use for a larger facility. What I'll show you in the, let's see. So that's just showing the carbon filter in the back. What you might see most likely in a dispensary setting that's growing uh, 99 plants or in a confined space, you'll see something like this, which is a smaller carbon filter, even though most of the smell is gonna come from the actual store from itself. So now we'll talk about the fertilizers or plant nutrients that, that they're using. For a small dispensary facility, what you're usually gonna see is a, a small fire cabinet with a few miscellaneous fertilizers, plant nutrients. But for the larger one in Desert Hot Springs, they actually have about 400-ish 400, 400 gallons of, of plant nutrients. Um, so it's just depending on where you inspect, what you'll see. It highly differs from facility to facility. Even though the large DHS facility has a, a large amount of bulbs, Smaller ones like this will only have nine high pressure sodium lights hanging from there. Obviously their waste stream is gonna be a lot lower. And uh, one of the ones in, Cat in Cathedral City, they're using fluorescence and high pressure sodium, but still the numbers are gonna be much lower. So for the Desert Hot Springs facility, this, they have all their chemicals stored into one room kind of on the outside of the building, placard, NFPA, everything uh, to meet with the hazmat business plan requirements. So basically the way, the way the system works is you'll see in the back there's these huge water tanks and what they'll do is they'll take their chemicals in either like these little five gallon, uh, five gallon buckets on the side, they'll go up, there's like a secondary level up there and they'll just basically mix their proprietary blend of Chem, uh, plant nutrients through the top and it'll be piped into the to the system so I'm just going back on this picture just to kind of show you so it all runs into the plants and there is a tray in the bottom that any runoff that that is that comes from the plants goes into a clarifier and out through through uh, through a sewer system So just normal f fertilizers that are used with uh, in, in this particular facility. They're using, they have two different, uh, they have 
two different types of fertilizer, like an A and B mixture. One they'll use for the vegetation early stage, and the other one they'll use during flowering. And it, it'll be, and it shows right there the, the uh, nitrogen, uh, phosphorus, and potassium levels, 154-4506. And just, um, just one thing to note, just make sure that you, you refer to the SDSs to see whether they're an oxidizer and they meet the 55-gallon threshold. Because it may be that some facilities are going to be using uh, something that is uh, a chemical that is just an irritant and sensitizer which has a higher threshold limit for permitting. So this is an MSDS for the particular uh, fertilizer that they're using at the DHS facility. As you can see there, there, it already has a signal word. It is an oxidizer, so the 55 gallon threshold limit applies in this case. Um, and I just, and this is just basically to summarize everything up. A lot of the legwork um, in permitting these facilities was uh, facilitated by the local municipalities, right? It's, you know, having, contacting the city, the planning department, the fire, it, it can just help with your uh, permitting process overall. Um, I know that, you know, what, what happened with DHS, they were basically saying, um, you know, you, you might want to, you might, you might want to check out this facility. and. You know, as we went up there and working together with municipalities, I know that Palm Springs likes to do their inspections together. And in facilities like this, um, it's always nice to take a, se a second person. In, in my case, not so much for security, just so that we can kind of collaborate together, because I know there are going to be some questions that I miss, and not all the information is going to stick in your head, so it's good to have a secondary person right there. Because I remember like the first time I inspected the facility and they tried to explain the whole process to me, I, I couldn't retain it. I was just like, where are, you, where are your chemicals? <laughs> yeah, but it, it's, it's interesting. And um, another, another bulletin I wanted to uh, focus on is operations may differ depending on region. Now, obviously out in the desert, it gets so hot and DHS, Cat City, Palm Springs is only uh, is only allowing indoor operations. We are gonna have a few greenhouses, but nothing outdoors. And I, I don't think that anything is gonna survive through the summer out there. Um, one thing I mentioned earlier, unannounced inspections may not be ideal. The way, the way I usually do it, and I, I don't know if this is Riverside County, or normal Coupa inspection, I just, I just show up. I don't usually do inspections, I see my list. And that's how I was hitting the dispensaries. Now, I got a lot of different res different responses, but overall, everybody was pleasant. I was let in into all the facilities, but there is there might be some apprehension from some, especially with with um, the background that that they've had, because these people have been growing for years, and this is a whole new process to them. So when you go so when you go in there and you try to explain to them what you're there to inspect, half the time they're uh, I don't know what you're talking about. That's what they usually tell me. Um, some of them, th they'll let you in and they think that you're there for a completely different reason even though you give them your spiel. I remember for one particular dispensary, I went in there, I explained everything. He's like, oh yeah, okay, come, come to the back. He starts taking out his product and he's like, you're here to weigh this, right? I was like, no, I'm, no, but, so I had to go over it again. They don't, they don't understand it, but I've usually gotten very positive reception from them. Once they realize that you're not there to bust them or get into them in trouble or to, you know, or to give them any problems and you just explain to it, they usually appreciate it. Um, and it creates good dialogue with the operators because there is a lot of information that they're able to relay to me. To me. Um, and it just helps because with, with these facilities, I'm able to contact them. They're very nice, they're very pleasant. You know, some of them will be like, oh, you can come in whenever you want. Just let them through the door anytime. And it's always good to build a good rapport. And knowing this, there are still a lot of facilities that we have a list on that I still have to inspect. And I kind of wish that I, that before I inspected these, I had some of the knowledge from the previous presentations. But this is just kind of an insight to what I've seen. It's going to continue to be a learning process. There are still a lot of questions that need to be asked about waste streams, about the hazmat especially with the extraction coming in. It, 
still a lot to focus on, but this is just kind of like, I just wanted to give you a small snapshot of what we've seen so far in Riverside County. And that's uh, pretty much it.